guests celebrating at a 21st birthday party were oblivious to the horrific contents of the green metal barrel which appeared in the background of their happy snaps. The guests were marking the birthday of Michael Hegarty, and the happy festivities were being held at Michael's father-in-law, Fred Boyle's property. As partygoers ate and drank, they could never have imagined that the body of their host's missing wife was hidden in the open, just metres away. Edwina Boyle went missing in October 1983, with her husband telling family and friends uh, that she had left him to start a new life with a truck driver named Ray. 23 years later, the truth came out. Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates, and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something, and every week I bring you a couple of cases from Australia's true crime history. If this sounds interesting to you, please help us out by shooting the like button with your trusty boomstick, stabbing that subscribe button, and then punching the notification bell in the face to be notified every time we release a new video. All of our episodes are released at the same time in podcast format on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, wherever you get your true crime podcast fix. Also, we now have something about murder merchandise, designed by myself, as well as Australian artist Redneck Kung Fu. It's just a few things here and there, just some t-shirts, but I'll put the link in the description for you. It's down below. Frederick Boyle claimed he hid the body of his wife Edwina Boyle out of panic after finding her dead in bed at their home on the outskirts of Melbourne in 1983. Frederick told investigators he found Edwina dead in bed with two bullets in her head and one of his neckties around her throat. And he thought he'd be a suspect because he was having an affair, so he hid her body in a green drum in his garage. Frederick William Boyle was born in 1950 in Cardiff, Wales. His English wife, Edwina Boyle, was born in Peterston, Super Eli, in the Vale of Glamorgan in England. In 1972, the two quickly married, and before long they left their family and friends and emigrated to Australia to establish a new life, where they had two children, Carissa and Sharon. Fred found work as a carpet layer, and Edwina was employed as a process worker at a chicken farm. In 1979, the two children commenced ice skating at the Frankston Ice Skating Rink. This became a focal point of interest for both parents, particularly after Carissa showed real talent in that sport. All evidence showed that Fred and Edwina had a pretty good relationship, up until midway through 1982. Fred met Virginia Gassara at ice skating events and formed an intimate relationship with her in October of that year. And then Edwina found out. So let's go to this. It was just after 6.30 in the morning when Thomas Turner pulled up outside his brother-in-law Fred's flat in the outer Melbourne suburb of Dandenong. Both men were carpet layers and took turns to drive each other to work. And on that day, Friday the 7th of October 1983, it was Thomas's turn to drive. Fred came to the door in his dressing gown. His eyes were red from crying. Thrusting a note into Turner's hand, he told his brother-in-law, between sobs, that his wife Edwina had left him for another man. The letter was written in the neat running script that Turner had seen on checks that Edwina had written a style very different from Boyle's handwriting. It said that Edwina had gone away with another man and was leaving her car and her bank card and her credit card behind. Shocked, Turner rang his wife, who was Boyle's sister, and read the message to her. He then headed for work. He felt bad about leaving, but somebody had to do the carpeting job that the pair had been booked for that day. And Fred, well Fred had some painful news to break to his two young daughters. 11-year-old Carissa Boyle woke a little later that morning. She was unable to get rid of this feeling of something being different. Her mother always came in to wake her and Sharon, her younger sister. Where was she? As the Victorian junior ice skating champion, Carissa had often been told that she was talented enough to make the Olympics. Skating was her world, and because of that, her parents as well. Her father served on the local skating rink committee, and Sharon also skated. Her mother, 
as we said, worked at a local chicken farm, but still found time to make her daughter's competition costumes, often spending her lunch hour sewing. At least three nights a week, Edwina Boyle would pick the girls up from school and take them to the skating rink, where they would stay until around about 8pm. In fact, the three of them had been at the rink the previous night, so Carissa could practice for a competition on the coming Saturday night. An important competition. They were expecting to go back again that night for a final practice. So Carissa and Sharon entered the kitchen at around 8am. Their father was typically gone by this point, um, but there he was. He was sobbing at the kitchen table in his dressing gown. Their mother was nowhere to be seen. Now, the girls had never before seen their father cry. They went to soothe him, their eyes welling up with tears from the shock. You know what it's like when you see your dad cry for the first time? It's horrible. So he drew them in close, one youngster on each knee, and he told them that their mother had left, taking some of her clothes, but leaving a note. She'd vanished in the middle of the night to be with a truck driver named Ray. The three sat together, hugging and crying, but although eight-year-old Sharon had heard her father's words, she didn't know exactly what they meant. Carissa understood a little more. On several nights over the past few months, she'd lain awake listening to her parents fighting about a woman that her father was seeing. The words, you've been with her again, kept recurring. And while the child didn't know what an affair meant, she knew those nighttime arguments had been about Virginia Gassara, a woman on the same skating parents committee as her father. So, still sobbing, Carissa obeyed her father's request that she ring Gassara. Boyle then took the phone and asked if he could take his daughters to her house. The girls spent the next few hours in Gassara's care. On their arrival, Boyle recounted to his lover the events of the last 12 hours, which had begun with him falling asleep on the couch after work and waking in the early morning to find his wife gone. Then Fred drove off. Although he did return in the early afternoon, he told Gassara that he'd just been driving around aimlessly. He then took his daughters to his sister, Mavis Ball. Soon afterwards, Gassara's husband returned from work. Along with most of the small community of skating parents, they were so close-knit, Sam Gassara had known about his wife's affair with Fred, and when he discovered that she'd also been looking after his rival's daughters, they fought. Virginia left, and she went straight to Fred. So, Fred and Virginia spent the next two nights in a motel. They're now a couple. It's almost as if uh, Edwina Boyle had never existed. But Boyle's business-as-usual approach went further than merely making sure that Carissa still competed in that weekend's competition. He used the event to inform all of the other skating parents that Edwina had deserted him and that Virginia had left her husband and had moved in with him. And so after making the announcement, Fred appeared to be sensitive about what the others might be saying or thinking. I suppose you think I murdered her, he said to one of the skating mothers. I don't know, she replied coolly. Did you? If any of them saw anything sinister rather than salacious in the disappearance of such a dedicated mother just before an important skating competition, they never picked up the phone to share their thoughts with the police. Look, Edwina's disappearance was definitely strange. She was distraught by her husband's infidelity and she'd just dropped a significant amount of weight, telling the one friend that she did confide in that she was attempting to keep her husband. And despite that, she'd abruptly left the apparently desirable man and her two daughters that she adored to go and begin a new life. Despite her hopes and her huge support of Carissa's skating, she'd stepped out on her on the eve of a major competition. And the partner in this uh, supposed new life? A man who nobody had seen or even heard Edwina speak of. And Fred, the jilted husband, he didn't even want to seem to find out the man's surname or track Edwina down, if only to convince her to come back to her daughters. Boyle's own family didn't question his account of Edwina's departure. His sister Mavis Ball was outraged by his behaviour at the time, but her objections were based on the perceived impropriety of his actions, including the fact that he had dumped his two uncontrollably upset daughters on her on the very day they had learned of their mother's departure and then gone to a motel with his lover. So, on the Sunday afternoon, Ball dropped in on Fred to find him and Virginia packing up all of Edwina's clothes and personal belongings, many of which had been wedding presents, and they were going to give them to charity. Edwina would be furious if she came back to find her clothes gone, her sister-in-law reasoned, and if she didn't return, her daughters should have got her belongings, right? 
She was also unimpressed to find her brother building bunk beds for Jisara's four children who, along with their mother, were about to move into the Boyle's small flat in Dandenong. Edwina Boyle had a second circle of friends, whom she had met through her passion for horses. Horse dealer and part-time accountant Ian Padgham had met the Boyles when he sold them a horse. He had been separated at the time and the Boyles had moved into a caravan uh, on his adjustment farm. Edwina had helped take care of his children and had done a little bit of housework for him. And along the way, Edwina and Padgham had become close enough for one of Boyle's sisters to have accused them of having an affair, although both denied this and there is little evidence to support it. Later on, Padgham and his new wife, Carol Collins, well, they'd lived in a caravan on the rural property occupied by the Boyles, an arrangement that ended when Padgham and Collins moved to their own property in 1982. The Boyles had also moved that year, relocating to the Dandenong flat from where Edwina later disappeared. The friendship continued, but with Padgham and Collins busy establishing their new farm and the Boyles spending most of their time at the skating rink, well, the couples have been seeing less of each other. And so, because Carol Collins wasn't a skating parent, she was unaware of Edwina's disappearance and this new couple of Fred Boyle and Virginia Gassara. And so she rang the Boyle's flat the night after the skating competition to speak to Edwina. Carissa answered the phone, telling her mother's friend that Edwina had gone down the street. Collins then heard Carissa telling her father what she had said and asking him, Is that alright? And so at that point, Fred took over saying his wife was out. And when Collins asked him to get Edwina to ring her, he said nothing about her having left him. Days later, after Padgham and Collins learned about Edwina's disappearance and began asking questions, Fred gave them the truck driver story. When Padgham asked to see the note, Boyle told him that he'd torn it up. Shocked by the story and more than a little suspicious, Padgham and Collins placed two newspaper advertisements. One was in the missing persons column of a Melbourne paper, and the other was in a rural newspaper, and it was headed Shetland Ponies, but contained a request for Edwina to make contact. The reference to horses, especially Edwina's favourite type, might draw her attention, the couple hoped, assuming she was uh, alive and well and able to see it. Padgham also spoke to Fred about reporting Edwina's disappearance to police, annoying him by pressing the issue. After Boyle failed to respond, Padgham took the matter into his own hands, approaching Collins' father, who had a friend at the Dandenong CIB named Peter Stewart. Stewart visited Boyle in late November, taking notes of the meeting in which an irritated Boyle had told him the truck driver story and said his wife had left at around 4.30 in the morning. He insisted his wife was not missing in the sense that would require a police investigation. Stewart was satisfied with this explanation and no further action was taken. So in the meantime, two other members of Edwina Boyle's horse circle had gone to the police. Tracy Watson, who had once had her horse adjusted at the Boyle's property, knew that Padgham and Collins were going to make contact with a policeman acquaintance. But, frustrated that nothing was being done, although Edwina had been gone for a month, she called in at Dandenong Police Station with another horsewoman friend of Edwina's. The two women did not specifically suggest murder, but they emphasised how uncharacteristic this departure was, telling the desk officer that Edwina would never have left her daughters. They also pointed out that Fred Boyle had moved his lover in before his wife's spot in the marital bed had even gone cold. The officer clearly believed that the women were overreacting. I say that because no record of their visit was kept and no action was taken. Ironically, it took a report registered in a police station 17,000 kilometres away in the UK to finally prompt local police to take action. Edwina's older sister, Val Bordley, would have raised the alarm immediately if she'd been living in Melbourne or maintaining the kind of regular contact that is now common with email, Skype and Zoom. But this was 1983, the pre-internet age of expensive international phone calls and communication via airmail. Bordley began to worry when Edwina's regular letters uh, ceased and her mother's birthday in November passed without the usual card. Then, in December, Edwina's sister Rosemary received a phone call and a letter from Boyle informing her that her sister had taken off with another man. His letter alleged that Edwina had been planning her departure for some time and referred to the note she'd left, which supposedly also said she didn't love him anymore and was leaving the girls with him as they were better off that way. The note that his brother-in-law had seen had not contained these extra details. His letter continued, The part that really gets to me the most is the two kids. It's been a month now since they've seen or heard from their mother, and for that I'll never forgive her. 
How do you explain to two kids that not only does their mother no longer love their dad, but she doesn't give a shit for them either? If you've already heard from her, please ask her to write to the kids. Rosemary, for her part, believed Boyle, who she had got to know when he and Edwina stayed with her before she left their home in the UK for Australia. She became bitterly angry with her sister and remained so for years. But Val Bordley was adamant that her sister's sudden silence was so out of character. It made no sense that she would cut off contact with her family, especially given that she'd earlier told Bordley about feeling homesick and she was supposed to be coming to attend an episode of This Is Your Life for an uncle. Fearing the worst and suspecting her brother-in-law of foul play, Bordley contacted Australia House and the Salvation Army, wrote to Australian media outlets and engaged a private detective. In January 1984, she went to the Shady Lane Police Station in Watford, Hertfordshire. The resultant Interpol inquiry was passed on to Victoria Police. Finally, an official missing persons investigation began. Carissa and Sharon Boyle's new life in an instantly blended family began in cramped conditions. For some months before they moved into the larger house that Virginia Gassara had built in the outer suburb of Beaconsfield, they had to share a bedroom with the four Gassara children. Both girls later portrayed their existence in this new household as a real-life Cinderella story, with Gassara cast as the wicked stepmother. Gassara's children, for example, well, they continued to ice skate, but Carissa's brilliant skating career came to a standstill, a decision she later attributed to Gassara. You remember she was going to be able to go to the Olympics? Their stepmother, the girls later claimed, made it clear that she hated the very sight of them, allegedly telling them that they were scum and belonged in the gutter, just like their mother. Other women in the skating parents' circle liked Kassara, describing her as a good mother to all the children. These women were more inclined to wonder what it was that either Edwina Boyle or Virginia Kassara had seen in Fred Boyle, both of them being such nice women. But in a reaction that many step-parents of teenagers would recognise, the girls' high regard for their father remained undiminished by the fact that their difficulties were a direct result of his choices. Logically, they should have blamed Fred for placing them at the mercy of their stepmother, but they seemed disinclined to reproach him for anything. On the contrary, they showed great empathy for him. And before their mother's departure, Sharon said that Fred had been very easygoing and fun, the life of the party, and would smile very easily. Afterwards, she often found him alone in the dark, crying. The girls blamed Gassara for all the inequities in their life, including the fact that Gassara drove her children to a uh, private school, while Carissa and Sharon walked to Berwick High School nearby. The house rule, according to Sharon Boyle, was that if Gassara walked into a room, the Boyle girls were to leave it, or if they were in the backyard and she went outside, they'd have to go inside. Quite often, when visitors came to the house, Carissa and Sharon were sent to their bedroom for the duration of the visit. The girls said that Gassara also told them to forget about beating her in any competition for their father. Apparently she used to say, don't ever make your father uh, try to choose between you and me, because you will lose. Finally, in 1988, the stepdaughters said Gisara effectively threw them out. I'm going out, she allegedly told them. Uh, when I get back, I want you gone. And so the girls spent seven months with their Aunt Mavis. Fred eventually split up with Gisara and he moved to a Nary Warren caravan park, where the girls joined him. They didn't know that their father had actually asked Mavis to look after them on a permanent basis, because he said he had a terminal illness. By late 1985, the Victoria Police missing persons investigation was complete. Dandenong-based detective Jack uh, Beanland had interviewed Fred Boyle, who continued to insist that his wife was alive and well, but clearly did not want to see her family. He told the detective that he'd been receiving interstate phone calls, because back then, when you got an interstate phone call, they'd go beep, 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 before uh, you answered it. Uh, but apparently when he answered, there was never a reply. Beanland had followed up two possible sightings of Edwina Boyle, but concluded that they were mistaken. Despite putting great effort into the search, he'd failed to find the health practitioner, who, according to Fred, had given his wife injections to help her lose weight. But he'd obtained Edwina's dental records and blood group details, running an Australia-wide check on any unidentified skeletal remains to see if they matched hers. He believed that she was most probably dead and had met with foul play. He had no evidence, nothing to justify a search warrant on Boyle's premises, but he also believed that Fred was likely to have been responsible for his wife's disappearance. He recommended that his report be forwarded to the Homicide Squad. 
and in January 1986, the private detective that Val Bordley had hired put in his final report. Like Jeff Beanland, the private investigator thought that Edwina Boyle had died at the hands of her husband, but did not believe he would ever be able to prove it. The case remained open after Beanland completed his report, with detectives regularly returning to question Gassara and Boyle, both of whom continued to assert their belief that Edwina was alive. At one point, Gassara stared down an entire panel of detectives, accusing her of knowing exactly what had happened to Edwina. In 1988, there was a renewed flurry of activity on the case, with homicide detectives inquiring into a possible link between Edwina Boyle's disappearance and the activities of the vicious rapist and killer Raymond Edmonds, nicknamed Mr. Stinky. He'd been living close to the Boyle's flat just before the disappearance and was familiar with the area in which the family had previously lived. He was also known for his habit of breaking into women's homes when their husbands were at work, but when children were in the house. Both Gisara and Boyle were adamant that they had no knowledge of the man. In 1989, statements were taken from Fred, his family, many of the skating parents, and finally, members of Edwina's horse circle, some of whom were unimpressed that they had not been contacted earlier. Boyle's daughters were asked straight out if they believed their father had killed their mother. He wouldn't have the guts, Carissa scoffed to the interviewer. He's a wimp. Sharon, for her part, she was certain that her father had not killed their mother. He still loved Edwina, she said, but he didn't want to see her again because of what she'd done. The police officer noted that both girls spoke of their mother as if she was alive, with Carissa saying that she still couldn't understand why Edwina had left, as she'd seemed so happy at home. And on the question of why Edwina hadn't made contact, Carissa could only speculate that possibly her mother was having a happier life and didn't want the memories. Their father had told the girls it would be their choice in the event of her mother's return if they wanted to see her or, or live with her. In 1992, Homicide Squad detectives reviewed the Edwina Boyle file once again and Fred was invited to the St Kilda Road Police Complex for an interview. He was not a credible interviewee. He claimed that he'd heard from his brother that Edwina had been in Spain, but was quickly exposed in this when the detectives broke off the interview to phone the brother and discovered that he'd said nothing of the sort. Full of bluster and bravado, Boyle talked of suing those who accused him of murder and even lectured the police on the frequency with which people disappeared and set up a new life. In 1993, Detective Rod Smith joined the Homicide Squad. Handed the Boyle file, he set out on a systematic search for evidence of foul play. It wasn't going to be easy. He had inherited a case in which the victim's husband was the chief and only suspect, but no body had been found, and there wasn't even enough evidence to justify a search warrant on the possible perpetrator's house. By the time Smith inherited the file, Boyle had moved five times. Undeterred, Smith obtained permission from the current occupants to search the Dandenong flat from which Edwina Boyle had disappeared. A builder pulled the carpet up and checked the floorboards to see if any had been taken up and replaced but there was no evidence of a body ever having been buried on the property. Police also combed the poultry farm, where Edwina Boyle had worked, but found absolutely nothing. While the homicide detective could not prove that Edwina Boyle had been murdered, there were ample grounds to believe that she was dead. Police therefore referred the case to the coroner, and an inquest into the suspected death of Edwina Boyle was scheduled for November 1994. It was Rod Smith's job to compile a brief of evidence for the coroner conducting that inquest. Even without a body, there were plenty of indications of Fred Boyle's involvement. Discrepancies peppered his account of the night of his wife's disappearance. He told Edwina's relatives that she left at 3 in the morning, but in 1983, when he was informally interviewed by Detective Peter Stewart, he had said 4.30. In any case, if he'd been asleep, as he'd also claimed, how did he know the time? And because he refused to answer questions at the inquest, he could not be cross-examined on this important point. Boyle had also told police that he'd fallen asleep on the couch in his clothes and woken to find his wife gone, yet his brother-in-law had arrived in the morning to find him in his dressing gown. And then there was the note that Boyle had shown to his brother-in-law and then destroyed. Suggestions that it was a forgery were bolstered when Thomas Turner, shown actual examples of Edwina's handwriting, conceded that they looked nothing like the note he remembered. Fred's whereabouts between the hours of 9 and 2 o'clock on the day he discovered his wife missing also remained a mystery. He told police he'd sat on the beach, but had spoken to Gassara of just driving around. It was difficult to not be suspicious of the visit that Boyle had made to the poultry farm where Edwina worked. Shortly after her disappearance, he'd called in to collect her wages, 
an act that underlined his greed, but also suggested that he knew she would never be able to collect the money herself. And around that time, Boyle had also sold his van, which had been parked in the drive on the night Edwina vanished. Yet it was new, and his excuse for selling it, that the engine had seized because he had failed to put oil in it, was at odds with his usual meticulous care of his cars. The material before the coroner included a statement from Boyle's daughter Carissa, by then 21, who still believed that her mother was alive. She said that she had no idea where Edwina was or why she had left, other than the fact that she wanted a better lifestyle or that she was unhappy. The coroner concluded that Edwina Boyle was dead, and that while the date, place, cause and circumstances of her death were all unknown, the weight of the evidence suggested the possibility of Fred being responsible for her disappearance by killing her. Yet there was no direct evidence of Fred's involvement, and while the possibility could not be discounted, the coroner concluded that there was insufficient evidence for her to make a finding that Boyle had contributed to Edwina's death. Enter Michael Hegarty. He joined the Boyle's family life in 1990, when he started dating Carissa. Within a matter of weeks, the 18-year-old had moved into Carissa, Sharon and Fred Boyle's flat in the beachside suburb of Frankston, and had begun doing carpet laying work with his prospective father-in-law. On meeting Carissa, Hegarty had heard that her mother was a missing person, who was, in her daughter's view, still alive and living a new life elsewhere. But the young man quickly realised that the police had other ideas. Detectives would come round every couple of years to interview Fred about his wife's disappearance. And so Hegarty was soon part of the family, marrying Carissa and fathering two sons with her. Along the way, he became well acquainted with Fred's version of the events surrounding Edwina's disappearance. It was also considered in the Boyle house that the police were targeting Fred unfairly. But were they? Hegarty often found himself staring at a green 44 gallon drum, its lid held down with a ring, that stood in the garage of the Frankston unit. It was big enough to hold a body. In 1992, when the family built a new house in the adjacent suburb of Carrum Downs, Hegarty moved with them, and the drum went too. It was stored in the carport, where it served as a drink stand during Hegarty's 21st birthday. When he looked at old family photos taken at other residences, he always looked for the drum, and he spotted it in the background of one 1988 photo taken when the Boyles were living in the caravan park. The thought of its possible contents gave him chills. He coped by making poor taste jokes about it to his friends, and even his father-in-law. Aha, Fred's probably got Edwina in that barrel, he'd say, and everyone would laugh and laugh. Boyle stated that the barrel held carpet laying glue that he'd been preserving, but it had become too old to use and too dangerous to just throw away. Hegarty asked him to take the drum out of the carport, but the merest idea of this made Boyle grumpy. The son-in-law actually loaded the drum into a trailer heading for the tip one day, but Boyle refused, and the drum was returned to the yard. Hegarty promised to dispose of the drum at least seven other times, but Boyle declined each time. In July 2006, the younger man's curiosity got the better of him. Failing to open the drum from the top because it was rusted shut, he hit it several times with a pick. He succeeded in gouging a hole, the result suggesting that its contents were not glue, which would have solidified over time and made putting a hole in it impossible. And so his second opportunity came two months later, in mid-September. By then he and Carissa had chosen to divorce, but they were still planning a joint birthday party for their two sons later that month. In preparation, Carissa had requested Hegarty to clear up the garbage in the backyard. He opted to cut the drum in two using an angle grinder this time after being urged by his brother and a friend. Two minutes later, the three guys were sitting there staring at a layer of concrete, probably mixed and placed beneath the bin's lid, an array of women's clothes, all in fine shape, some carpet underlay and a slimy looking hessian wool bale. Hegarty's body in the barrel theory, it seemed, had been proven wrong. Disappointed with this anticlimactic end to 16 years of speculation, he didn't even think to ask if the clothes were Edwina's. Hegarty had recently purchased a set of new wheelie bins for storage. While the cleanup continued that day, Boyle requested one of them to keep his tools in. When they packed the trailer for the tip, Hegarty kept hunting for the Hessian bale from the drum, wanting to take a closer look. He assumed it was already in the garbage because he couldn't find it, despite the fact that he could see the drum and the garments. He drove to the tip with Boyle, who insisted on accompanying him to assist. Hegarty searched in vain for the bale as they emptied the trailer. It was mid-October when Hegarty began doing a final cleanup in the shed. 
His father-in-law had thrown all their tools into a pile, and he needed to retrieve his stuff from the communal pile. He took out a couple of power tools and some black plastic bags from the wheelie bin that he'd given to Boyle. The hessian wool bale that had reportedly gone to the tip the previous month was lying beneath. He swallowed his trepidation and thrust in his palm, reeling from the terrible odour emerging from it. His fingers brushed over the slimy sponginess of decomposing flesh, followed by something a little more solid. When he pulled it out, he discovered what appeared to be a human pelvis and leg bone. He continued searching round in the sack, choking back increasing nausea. After pondering about the drum and its contents for 16 years, and then believing that his suspicions had been proven wrong, he had to know. And finally, he discovered a human skull. In disbelief, he dashed to the house, stripping naked at the back door, before sprinting inside for a long shower. He called his wife and demanded that she come over to the house right away, and then he downed some Valium. Hegarty showed Carissa her mother's skull and called Sharon, who arrived with her husband at the house. She couldn't look at this horrible discovery, but encouraged him to phone the cops. At around 2 o'clock that afternoon, police crime scene investigators arrived in Boyle's backyard. They photographed the wheelie bin with the Hessian bag emerging from it before sealing and delivering it to the mortuary of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine. Homicide investigators arrived at Fred Boyle's place and they sat in the living room, waiting for him to return from work so they could arrest him. Meanwhile, Rod Smith had received the phone call he'd been waiting for for 13 years. It's far from automatic that the detective who last worked on a cold case is asked back in to close it and guide it through the courts. Uh, he was in command of the Criminal Investigation Unit in the Victorian small town of Benalla at the time, so he hadn't had any updates on the Boyle case in a while. And so he was overjoyed to have the Edwina Boyle file returned to him. The case's impending conclusion provided a tremendous deal of personal joy. The Boyle case had been one of the most frustrating of all the cases he'd worked on. So many detectives had worked on it. They'd been so close, but so far away, because the body had not been found. And so there was a spring in his step as he entered the St Kilda Road police complex and took the lift to the ninth floor homicide offices. Uh, Boyle was now waiting for him in one of the squad's pokey little interview rooms. That night, forensic pathologist Dr Malcolm Dodd supervised the reopening of the Hessian bag, carefully setting out its contents on a stainless steel examination table in the VIFM mortuary. The whole mass of material inside was CT scanned, recording a mix of human remains, an electric blanket, a segment of a foam mattress, and some material resembling bedsheets. Forensic odontologists Tony Hill and Jeremy Graham were on hand with Edwina Boyle's dental records, which had been at the Institute of Forensic Medicine since 1984, when the missing persons investigation into Edwina's disappearance had begun. Comparing them with the newly discovered skull and mandible, they were able to confirm that the body of Edwina Boyle had finally been found. The next morning, Malcolm Dodd began the task of cleaning the bones and reassembling them into a skeleton. He found different items of jewellery within the remains, but because the bones had shifted when the drum had been moved around, it was impossible to tell which rings had been on which fingers. A knotted man's tie also presented a puzzle. The pathologist could not ascertain whether it had been tied around the victim's neck. Still, he wondered if it had been used to strangle or at least restrain the victim. It was certainly knotted rather than tied in the usual configuration. He could see two broken ribs, but he had to conclude that these injuries might have happened after death, as the victim's body was moved. The expert's main focus was the squamous temporal bone on the right side of the skull, the vulnerable thin area beneath the temple. A large chunk of bone, about 50 by 34 millimetres, was missing, with a few fractures radiating from the central defect. There was a small fracture above the right eye, others within the eye socket itself, and another through the left cheek. The injury was a penetrating one, as if a blunt instrument had gone through the skull. A few hours later, Dodd, a ballistics expert and author of a big old book on bullet wound injuries, found himself investigating the possibility that the injury was caused by a .22 bullet. A .22 bullet doesn't usually have an exit wound, because it tends to rip itself apart, inflicting extensive harm. This means that when the wound is looked at in autopsy, not much of the bullet remains to be matched to a specific weapon. Metallic fragments were discovered uh, using CAT scanning. The previous evening's CAT scan revealed some intriguing white specks inside the skull, on the other side of the hole. It appeared to be a gunshot wound. 
Dodd sought confirmation from forensic anthropologist Dr. Soren Blau, who is a regular at crime scenes where skeletal remains have been discovered. The expert recovered all of the tiny bone fragments, some of which were inside the skull, rebuilding it so perfectly that she was able to decrease Dodd's 50 by 34 mm triangular hole to a, a hole with a diameter of just 10 mm. This was still somewhat larger than a .22 caliber projectile, but because the bone in this location is wafer thin and exceedingly fragile, a larger flaw was to be expected. Suddenly, the damage was starting to appear to be a bullet hole. The scientists recovered six metal shards, each less than a millimeter in diameter, which were transported to the Victoria Police Forensic Service Centre Trace Evidence Unit and inspected under electron microscope. They were made of lead and antimony, which are both components of a .22 bullet. Dodd was able to determine that Edwina Boyle died as a result of a single gunshot to the head. He couldn't tell if the gun was held close to the victim's head when it was shot due to decomposition. A shot fired from a distance could be interpreted as an accident later on. A shot fired near the head strongly suggested murder. In such a circumstance, fresh skin would have displayed sooting or burning. No such luck in this case. But Dodd's findings were conclusive enough to support a murder accusation. The Crown Prosecutor later claimed that Fred Boyle murdered his wife on the evening of the 6th of October 1983, deposited her body in the drum, and then went on a 23-year charade in which he pretended to be a man abandoned by his wife. Soren Bloor was satisfied with the work that she had done on this instance, but she couldn't help but think of the horrible repercussions for the two Boyle daughters. Her meticulous reconstruction of their mother's skull had revealed knowledge that would aid in the destruction of the mental cosmos they'd been inhabiting for the last two decades. These thoughts, however, had little bearing on Frederick William Boyle's trial. This trial began in January 2008, with the prosecution's evidence echoing much of what was stated at the coronial inquest in 1994. The discovery of the body and the ability of the forensic pathologist to determine the specific cause of death had turned a spider's web of possibilities into a solid noose of evidence. Smith had discovered that Boyle had once owned a .22 rifle. Josira told the court that he sold the weapon within 12 months of the disappearance of Edwina. It was also known that Edwina had had no idea how to load or use a gun. Boyle elected to testify with his own defence. He'd been a successful liar for 23 years. This gave him little doubt that a jury would not believe him now. His story was meticulously designed to correspond with the facts disclosed by Malcolm Dodd's post-mortem report. Ray, the truck driver, was not mentioned, nor was Edwina's message, which was torn apart when a sympathetic witness saw it. Instead, Fred, the cook oldered spouse, was substituted, with Boyle, the victim, who was so terrified of the machinations of inept and bullying cops that he covered up a murder rather than risk being accused for it. Boyle claimed he returned home late on the evening of the 6th of October and climbed into bed next to his wife, whom he presumed was sleeping. He laid there for a moment before nudging her. He turned on the light when she didn't answer, and to his surprise, he found himself looking at a dead body. His wife was shot in the head, and then strangled with one of his own tyres. I didn't know what to do. I went in and checked on the girls, he told the jury. They were alright. I went back in, and I just sat there for a little while. I just didn't know what the hell to do. He had come to the realisation that he was in some serious fucking trouble. After sitting in the kitchen for hours, weeping in despair, who could believe that a man who was having an affair with another woman had returned home to discover his wife shot in the head? So he put Edwina's body and part of her clothes in a huge wool bale bag that he kept in the van, along with linens from the bed and a section of the mattress that he ripped away because it was stained with blood. And then, after dragging it to the van, he checked his rifle, which was still hidden in the wardrobe and the bullets were kept separately in a drawer and all were accounted for. So he didn't call the cops because he was afraid of being accused of murdering his wife. He laughed aside the prosecutor's suggestion that he should have known that the police would have been able to identify whether his gun had been discharged. He admitted to the jury that he was not a bright man, and this was before the television show CSI, when such information became well known. In the morning, with his brother-in-law set to arrive and his two children still in bed, he'd come up with a narrative that Edwina had left him for another man, and the note, which had taken him a long time because his own handwriting was terrible. Boyle stated that he was shocked that his brother-in-law believed him. 
Once he'd repeated the same narrative to his girls, his priority was to get out on his own and plan out what he was going to do next. And that's when he had the inspiration for the drum. He'd poured levelling compound across the top, replaced the lid and tightened the seal after laying his wife's body inside. He claimed that it had been out of respect that he had kept the body close to him. And so he told the court, My wife died in a terrible way and I was not going to let her remains be thrown down to the tip like bloody garbage. So I held on to the drum and it stayed with me all the time. At least now she's got a decent burial, which is what I wanted. I knew if I died or got killed in a crash or something like that, the contents of the drum would always be found, and that's why I made no attempt to hide it and no attempt to bury it. Smith was more inclined to believe Boyle had kept the body around because he didn't have to worry about it being discovered as long as it was in his sight. He was relieved though to hear Boyle's explanation of his conduct. It was so ridiculous, he thought, that no jury would ever swallow it. Boyle's defence attorney made a gallant effort to concentrate the jury on the inherent illogic of a married man killing his wife on a school night, with his children present and his brother-in-law scheduled to pick him up at 7am the next morning. She indicated that if he was truly desperate to terminate his marriage and pursue his lover, there were many easier methods to accomplish this. Well, the jury thought otherwise, possibly concluding that Edwina Boyle had died because she had announced a plan that was shocking enough to make her husband snap and kill her. One such report was that Edwina was going to take part in an episode of This Is Your Life in respect of her uncle. Suggestions were that she told Fred that she was going to take the kids to England for it and stay there. He snapped. Anyway, the jury convicted Frederick Boyle of the murder of Edwina Boyle. Medical findings, Boyle's behaviour while on remand where he counselled other prisoners, and a heartbreaking victim impact statement from Edwina Boyle's sister Val Bordley were among the materials Justice Jack Forrest had to consider in determining a suitable sentencing. Bordley claimed that her brother-in-law's lies had split and damaged her family, especially between herself and her sister Rosemary. Bordley herself was greatly traumatised by the fact that her sister's bones had been discovered in a metal barrel in Boyle's yard when she was desperately lobbying for an investigation into her sister's disappearance. Judge Forrest was also shown comments from Boyle's two daughters, then 35 and 32, who had refused to accept the jury's verdict despite all evidence to the contrary. The judge said, Each of them attests to your devotion as a father and grandfather and their love for you despite the jury verdict. Each wishes you to have the opportunity at some point of time to see your grandchildren outside of jail. And each says that you have been a caring and devoted father through thick and thin. The judge made it plain that he saw the girl's loyalty as a result of their having been motherless for the majority of their lives. This was the result of Boyle's conduct, which had removed the girl's mother from their life and whose lies, or fiction as the judge described it, had later destroyed their memory of her but he was still willing to embrace Boyle as a loving and committed parent. But Frederick William Boyle was sentenced to 21 years imprisonment with a non-parole period of 17 years. His daughters shed tears as the sentence was read out in court and so commenced the undoing of years of their thinking that their father was innocent. Frederick Boyle will be eligible for parole in 2025, by which time he will be 75 years old. Unfortunately, he enjoyed 23 years of freedom before he was caught for his wife's murder. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next time as we trawl through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. If you've enjoyed this video, once again, please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick, stab that subscribe button, and uh, make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. It really helps us out. And remember, all of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And I'm on Instagram at something about murder, and I respond to every message I receive. So I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope that you don't get murdered. Stay safe out there. Bye. 23 years in a barrel. Woo!